We are live and we are broadcasting, guys. The floor is yours. Great. Uh, once again, thanks, Peter Mendiola, for taking care of all of our Zoom calls for us through this whole Zoom series. Uh, welcome, Cobble Banker. Uh, good afternoon to uh, my agents in Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin with Cobble Banker Real Estate Group and the rest of our friends throughout the country and world, throughout the Cobble Banker system. Uh, we're lucky to have our good friend, Peter Parnig, with us today from Ninja Selling. Uh, for those I think most know Peter, uh, but Peter is a former Cobble Banker owner of, uh, um, with his partners, Mike and Joe from Cobble Banker Legacy. I think we've got quite a few legacy fans, um, our uh, agents and staff and managers on the, on the uh, Zoom today with us. So we're lucky enough to have Peter with us. He's gonna talk about, um, you have to paddle to catch the wave today. Um, Peter has sent, um, installed probably 450 to 500 of our Cobble Banker Real Estate Group uh, agents through the Ninja, Ninja installation process. Uh, we like to say we bleed blue, but we also bleed Ninja um, at Cobble Banker Real Estate um, Group. I know that Peter at CB West has put quite a few of his agents through um, the program. And Peter, I believe you've done all the installations for him as well. So we love seeing you. We love having you. You're a friend um, on top of our ninja guru, I'll call you. Um, but you definitely keep our agents engaged. Um, we have agents that have gone through this um, installation process uh, three and four times. Um, so I think they just enjoy seeing you. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for all you do. Um, and I'm looking forward to your presentation today. Mike, thank you ever so much. Peter, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, let me go ahead and share the screen and let me get this baby going here. Mm, hang on, stop share. Hang on. So Peter, uh, real quick, so everyone knows, we've got probably about 35 or so minutes that you're going to present and then we will open this up for Q&A. So, I will tell everyone on the Zoom, feel free to throw out questions along the way. Uh, don't wait to the end so we can kind of compile those um, and we'll try to get as many of those answered um, at the end, probably the last 20 minutes or so and try to have everyone out of here within that hour. So yeah, that's my goal as well, especially if we can make this. There it is, awesome. Who would have known that? Uh, all right, Peter, all yours. Okay, do you see something that looks like Ninja Selling on the cover? Yes. Awesome. So first of all, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'm excited to be here. This is a special day for me as you know, I, I, I joined Cold Banker in 1998 and, and uh, Mike said it perfectly, I still bleed blue and I talk ninja. So the question to everybody on the call, how are you feeling today? You know, as, as I talk to people around the country, there's this wild change that's happening that people are highly, highly emotive. And what we discovered is that people are going from terror to, oh, no, this is fine, to no, we're going to crush this thing, back to scared. And what we've noticed is that cycle can happen all in one minute. Uh, people are very, very, um, uh, I don't know if on edge right now, but their emotions are on their shirt sleeve. Uh, most of you know me. Uh, this is who I am. I'm a CCIM, CRS, CRB, and an SOB, son of a broker. I know that Mike Prodell is also the son of a broker in SOB. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Cold the Banker Legacy with my two partners, now ex-partners, Joe and Mike. We've been the number one real estate company in New Mexico since 1998 and still are. So the goal going forward today is May 6th, is there's a differentiation between surviving and thriving. We want to thrive, not just survive. Survive is getting by. It's what victims do. Thriving is what players do. So there are five things that we believe it's worth focusing on when you are thriving. The first is to focus your people and yourself on some of the certainties. The first certainty is there is a market. There's markets all over the country, wherever you are. The second is we recognize you have to focus on significance, the significance of your people, the significance of what we provide uh, to the marketplace. We call that the caring portion of it. The third thing we wanna keep focusing on for everybody, ourselves and for our customers, clients, friends, is a hope for the future. In other words, we have to remind ourselves why, uh, what our vision of the future is. One of the questions we're asking everybody is, if 
when we get released for real, what's the very first thing you want to do when you have your freedom back? In other words, we want to pull people towards the positive side of the future, including ourselves. Number four, we recognize that being part of a tribe is a really important piece right now. People need to belong because since we've been so separated, uh, our tribes are now Zoom tribes. It's really an interesting phenomenon. But most importantly, your Zoom tribes, and I'm watching how Peter and Mike and many, many of the other great um, hold the banker brokers in the country are doing this, they're creating a, 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 a virtual tribe. And what we're discovering more than ever, that's important right now because we are so sequestered. And then finally, we wanna focus on the things that we can do, not the things that we can't do. In other words, in as much as we're in what I would call metaphorical prison, there's a ton of things that we can be doing. So let's go through those. Uh, we found this phrase, which I think was just beautiful. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to, pa to pass. It's learning how to dance in the rain. And so right now, one of the things it's to remember, there is a market, people are selling houses, uh, and it's important that we either make the decision to be on the sidelines or dancing in the rain. So just a quick question about what we see is ahead. Um, we found this really interesting survey of 50 leaders from across a section of major industries in the country. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers found it. And the question was asked if COVID-19 were in today, in other words, there was a, an abrupt just cliff, how long would, it, would you estimate would take your company to get back to business as usual? 66% of leaders, and these are Fortune 100 companies, said, oh, less than a month. And 90% said one to three months. In other words, there's still a great deal of forward-looking optimism uh, in the economy right now. Everything we're seeing is that people believe that the housing industry will have one of the quickest comebacks. And there's a reason for that. We are one of the three basics in life. Number one, food. Number two, shelter and clothing. Those are the three basics that everybody needs. We happen to be in the shelter business, which is fantastic. And so we think we're in the right place at the right time, and that there has been for the last two or three months a pretty significant pent up demand. In most markets in the country, there was pretty high demand going into this. I know in Albuquerque, uh, the first quarter, January, February, and going into March were some of the best three months we've had in years. And nothing has changed that demand. We think that our income has not been lost, it's been postponed. Uh, so the question is, what should you do? One of our favorite quotes is that success often comes to those who get in front of the inevitable. Uh, now I know that surfing is a huge part of the activities for Colder Banker Real Estate Group. Wisconsin is a huge surfing culture as is Indiana and Illinois. <laughs> uh, that would be a joke. Peter Mendiello, you're supposed to smile at that. Uh, but for those of you who don't know much about surfing, the way it works is surfers sit in the water. They sit in the ocean and generally it's kind of calm, there's little swells. The whole time they're looking behind them and what they're trying to anticipate is the next good wave. When they see the wave coming, and it often comes well before uh, they have to do something, the first thing they do is figure out where to catch the wave, where's the best place to catch it. And then the second thing is well before the wave gets there, they have to start paddling to get up to speed. If they don't paddle, they miss the wave. So what's the metaphor? We think there are two, and this is part of the significance that we ha have to offer to our people and to ourselves. Uh, we have a simple phrase. When it's time to harvest, it's too late to plant seeds. Another way to put it is, it's too late to paddle when the wave is here. So we think that there's some crazy urgency right now. And the reason is, we're in phase four of this whole thing, which is the re-emergent phase. And it's more uncertain, frankly, than any of the other phases. Uh, phase three, which was when we went into quarantine, we knew exactly what we were supposed to do. We were supposed to be at home. We were supposed to order things online. We were supposed to socially distance, wait 14 days. And within 30 days, we had all adapted and created a very clear routine. Now we're trying to figure out what the new routine is. What's it gonna be like to go to a restaurant? What's it gonna be like to hold an open house? And we're back in a very strong, uncertain, uh, and unpredictable space of what the new normal is gonna look like. 
But here's what the urgency is. Um, we don't know how long it's going to be, but let me give you some math. Let's assume that we only have two or three weeks before we're kind of back in the not sitting in our Zoom chair all day long routine, but we're actually going about and we're going to stores a little bit more. When that actually happens, and I'm not willing to make a prediction, all of a sudden there's going to be a shift. And, and right now I want to give you some interesting data. Um, let's assume that we've got two to three weeks before we kind of go back to the old frenetic way that we used to live. If that's true, and this is what I'd urge us all to do, let's assume that we on average have 200 people on our database. Some people have more, some people have less, less but that's the ninja target. Let's say we have 10 working days before things shift. What that really means that our number one task for the next 10 days is to connect with everybody on our database. In other words, you've got to be making 20 connections per day. And let me talk about that. I believe that the, that the old social contract has been amended. And what that means is, uh, imagine you're an agent and you sold a house and you failed to stay in contact with your customer, with your buyer, and you hadn't talked to them for a year, year and a half. Prior to the COVID pandemic, if you called those people, about 25% of the people that you called would pick up. First of all, you'd have that huge guilt that agents love to live in, which is, well, I haven't contacted them for a year and a half. I wonder if they're going to be mad at me. I don't know if I should even call them. That's going to be a weird call. And we didn't call. And even if we did, only a quarter of them actually picked up the phone. But interestingly, our research has, our research has shown in the last 45 days, 80% of people are picking up the phone. If you call somebody, 80% are picking up on the first try. In other words, they're not letting it go to voicemail because they're interested in connection. So here's what we think. Right now, we have this unique opportunity to call everybody you know, even buyers and sellers you haven't talked to for three or four or five years, and you can say something simple like, hey, you know, I was just thinking about you during this whole time. You know, we haven't talked for four or five years. You don't need to apologize about it right now. All you need to do is connect with them, and we're going to show you how to do that. The point is, this window may close, because when we go back to hyper busy like we were used to, I'll bet you people are going to go back to the 25% pickup, and you don't have this grace period where you can call anybody right now. The second thing I want to add is, don't think the people on your database, think everybody you know. This is a globe, not just a community. I was talking to somebody, a Colder Banker agent in Wilmington, North Carolina. He said, well, Peter, you're telling me to call 20 people a day on my database? I've only lived here two years. I've only got 80 people on my database. And I said, well, I understand that. Um, uh, but you're, you're still thinking like a real estate agent trying to get business rather than a person trying to make connections. And I asked him where he moved from. And coincidentally, he said, from Chicago. I said, how many people did you know in Chicago? He goes, 1,000. I said, well, why wouldn't you call them? And he goes, because they're not going to buy a house in Wilmington. And I said, please let go of the idea of they're not going to buy a house because here's how it's happening right now. You're going to call somebody you haven't talked to in 10 years from Chicago. Could be an old workmate. They're going to go, oh my gosh, Peter, I can't believe you called. And you're going to go, how are you feeling these days? What's going on? You'll have a great conversation. And then the person you called will say something weird like, you know, remember that guy, Bobby, we used to work with? Well, I called him and he's living in Idaho right now, but you know what's so weird? He's got somebody who's moving to Chicago and I don't know anybody. Do you work in Chicago? And you go, I sure do. Quit thinking local, think global because all kinds of connections are to be made. And here's the key, live is the answer. Please do not text, please do not send an email. Pick up the phone and call these people. And so the question is, what should I say and what should I ask? So I wanna deal with, the idea that your job is to connect your tribe. You have your, your, your work tribe, which is Colder Banker in your company, but all of your colleagues, your friends, your clients everywhere really are your tribe. And that's where the future lies. This is the wave that we're gonna see. When you call, we like this idea, be a fountain, not a drain. And I wanna talk about the three questions that we're hearing all the time right now. To remind you, for those who've been through a Ninja installation, the law of authenticity, the fourth law in the Go-Giver says, the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. 
And so, you know, every manager, including myself, when I was, you know, in, in, in day-to-day management, I remember everybody said, hey, Peter, you got to make your calls. And everybody was, you have to make your calls. And I don't know about you, but that always triggered this weird feeling in me like it was a duty and I was prospecting. Most people don't like to prospect, as we teach in Ninja. People don't like to be prospected. So what if for the next two weeks and going forward, instead of saying, go make your calls, what if we said, let's go gifting ourselves? And so let's change the mindset that when you call people, you're giving the gift of yourself, which is your most valuable. In Ninja, success habit number eight says make 50 live interviews a week. We got to amp that up right now because of the timing. So our suggestion is get dressed as if you're in business, even if you're at home, put on your favorite music, get in, in the right frame of mind. Remember the math that we have a very short time frame before it is possible that the social contract reverts to what it used to be and you don't have this opportunity. And then let's talk about what to ask and how to respond. So the three questions we're hearing and uh, in the chat box, if I'm missing any, uh, you can put that in, but these are the, the three categories. People are saying, hey, Peter, what do you think is going to happen to home prices? What do you think is going to happen to the market? Um, second question is, is this a good time to sell my house? Should I wait or should I put it on the market? And then, of course, the third one, they're going, is it a good time to buy? Do you think the market's going to trash? If it can crash, if I buy now, will I buy too hard? What's it going to look like? And we want to give you what we think the ninja way to answer this is. The first thing when somebody asks you a question now, do not answer the question. What's most important is to find out what they're feeling and thinking. Because here's the problem. If you jump in with your opinion and they have a very different opinion, you might alienate them rather than connect with them. Because if they're on the fear side of it and you're on the positive side, they're gonna go, yeah, you're just another salesperson cheerleader. So what we wanna do is we wanna ask them, well, you know, we, we think about this all the time, but tell me what your viewpoint is. What do you think the future looks like? Everybody wants to share their opinion right now. Let them, let them go ahead and talk. And then the responses we wanna give are not opinions, we wanna give data. Um, and because that keeps you out of the op-ed opinion factory, which we think is just a wreck. So you're gonna hear everything from, oh my gosh, you know, with the amount of uh, national debt we have, this is gonna be, take years to get out of, to, uh, oh no, this thing's gonna rebound back. Everybody will respond based on their viewpoint. So here's a possible response. I'm gonna give you two. Um, you know, the way we look at it is we pay attention to the basics of supply and demand. Housing is one of the three basic human needs, uh, which are clothing, shelter, and food. And you may not know this, but some sources say that over the last 10 years in the country, since the Great Recession, there's a new housing shortage of over 4,500,000 units nationwide. So overall, we think that the fundamentals are still very positive. In other words, state of fact rather than an opinion. Uh, one of the things you might put up in front of you, and everybody uh, you know, has access to this through Focus First, I think it's really important to be familiar with your, your area appreciation over the last 25 years. I, uh, well, this is 35 years. I just arbitrarily picked up Chicago, Naperville, Evanston. But if you look at this, um, this is really important. Generally, you've had crazy appreciation other than in the Great Recession. And so using a fact like this, what you might say is what's gonna happen to home prices or what's gonna happen to market. Um, you know, here in, in the Chicago area, only once have home prices dropped significantly since 76 which was during the Great Recession, 2008 to 12. Here's something you might not know. The average appreciation, including and taking in the drop in the Great Recession, has averaged more than 4% per year over the last 35 years. In other words, overall, home prices have been very predictable and stable over the long run. And really, really, don't, we don't see anything different in this point. We still have the basics of supply and demand. So the idea that you want to do is A, have some data and be reassuring based on uh, not just an opinion, but some facts. Second question we're hearing is, well, is this a good time to sell my house? Um, remember, we're gonna ask a question before we offer a, um, a solution. So we're gonna ask two questions. That are, this is really two questions in one. So let me ask you, what's your greatest concern? If your house sold, what would you do? 
Let them tell you. And then when they answer that, you're gonna find out how to answer the question. So it may be that their greatest concern is showings. It, there may be their greatest concern is if I put my house on the market, there's only bottom feeders out there. But don't answer the question until you know the question that they're asking. So our response might be, well, um, there are still buyers pretty actively in the market. As an industry, we've adapted very quickly to doing business virtually. For example, we're doing virtual showings. Uh, would you be comfortable with that? And by the way, we'll pick a price that, that's safe for you. And if you get a low offer, you don't have to take it. But here's our next assignment. We need to be very current on the numbers. And here's a plan for the next two weeks. First of all, we think that March is ancient history. In Ninja, we talk about doing annual real estate reviews. But frankly, what happened in March doesn't matter anymore. Everybody is so hyper timely based on the, on the pandemic. They've been watching the stock market and they're imputing the, the, the swells in the stock market to the housing market. So here's what we want to do. Um, and Peter, you want to role play a little thing with me? You unmute and let's see what this might sound like. You there? Yeah, I'm here. So I want to kind of get a little, this is a pair of Peters. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Here's the way this is going to work. We're talking about calling somebody and um, I, want to, I want to show you what we're going to do. We're not going to do a real estate review. We're going to do a real estate update. And what we want to know is what has happened in their neighborhood in the last 30 days. All you need to know is the new listings and new contracts. Uh, and then maybe for you, larger for your total market area. And so I want to show you the questions we're hearing, which we've done. Uh, and then Peter and I are going to role play how this is going to look. So I'm just getting Peter, uh, you, hold on one second. You can, you, can, you can get in shape for this, all right? So the third question is, is it a good time to buy? And as a good ninja, we're going to ask the question, well, tell me what you're thinking. We want them to share it with us. Then here's a possible response. You know, if the current situation had been caused by an economic failure, we might be more skeptical, but the current economic climate is really being caused by a non-economic outside influence. There are still a ton of people who want to sell, so it might be a great time to buy if you can manage it economically. In other words, give them data, not an opinion. So here are the four questions you should ask. I'm going to show you all four of them, and then Peter and I are going to practice this in, in a live. We think right now that the right question to ask is, how are you feeling, not how you're doing? How are you doing was the question we've asked for the last 20 years in normal markets. It's sort of the, hey man, how are you doing? But right now, people are so emotionally available and wound up, we wanna give them the opportunity to share that with us. It's a very different question for very different times. Then the follow-up question is, is a really great question. What's making you most nervous right now? We want to allow people to share with us. Then of course, you know, if they ask about real estate, what are your thoughts about the market? And then I think it's totally fair and appropriate in a connecting moment to ask them, how's your financial situation right now? Has anybody in your family been fired? Are you okay? Did you lose your job? Now is the best time we've ever had to be truly connected to people. So Peter, let's role play this baby. You there? I'm here. I'm ready. So let's assume that Peter and I, I sold Peter a house a year ago. I haven't talked to him. I've been out of touch. I've been feeling guilty about calling him because, you know, I'm a real estate agent and we, uh, our default position is paranoia. Um, and so I'm going to pick up the call and watch how this rolls and see if you could imagine this. So I'm going to go ring and Peter's going to answer. So ring. Hey, Peter, how's it going? Uh, Peter, this is Peter Parnag at Cold Banker West. You may not remember me, but I sold you your house about a year ago, and you've been crossing my mind during this whole crazy time, and I, I just felt like it was the right time to pick up the phone and say, hey, man, how are you feeling about this whole thing? Oh, man, I really appreciate your call. I, I, I have, of course, not forgotten about you. How could I? You're, you're a great agent. Um, thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much for calling and reaching out. How are you feeling? How are you feeling about this whole thing? Oh man, not going to lie. Nervous to leave my house, nervous to get back to work, but at the same time, really want to get back to work, want to get back in the office. Yeah. What's making you most nervous right now? I mean, the mechanics or what? I think it's the news, just seeing everything on the news and knowing that or thinking that if I go to the store, I might get sick and might die. 
I know, isn't it weird? It's it's, it's scary. Yeah, and it's and it's you know we we were just talking in our household. It's hard not to see everybody that you don't know as a potential death threat. You know, it's 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 weird, isn't it? Yeah. Well, totally. yeah. So you know, a lot of the the people that I know are also concerned about the real estate market, and so before I picked up the phone, I, I just looked in your neighborhood and kind of, I was curious about what's going on in your area. And so here's what I found. Can I share it with you? Would you like to hear? Of course. Yeah. So in, in your immediate neighborhood in the last, since April, since, you know, since we've been totally locked down, uh, four houses have actually come on the market. There've been four new listings. And interestingly, two of them have sold, two of them are already under contract. And to me, that was pretty encouraging. And I'd like to share it with you. If you want to see the actual uh, listings, I'd be happy to send them over. But I thought you might be, uh, might be curious to know what's been going on. Yeah, definitely. I, I thought I saw in the news that real estate market's crashing. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the news oftentimes is the, we sometimes call that the worst terrorist. Um, but that's why I wanted to give you this very current information because uh, we're discovering that most markets are only down about 25 or 30 percent. There's still a lot of activity. 65 or 70 percent of people are still buying and selling and they're happy to do it. And I just wanted to share that data with you. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Last question. Uh, how's your financial situation right now? Is everything okay? Has anybody lost a job? What's going on personally? Um, I'm still employed, just can't physically go to work. So doing everything from home right now. So awesome Great for that. So sometime in May, you might get loose and go into the office. Is that the plan or still up, up in the air? Just waiting to hear. We're still on lockdown here in San Diego, but we're, we're waiting to hear that news. Yeah. Day at a time, right? Well, Peter, first of all, thank you so much for picking up the, uh, picking up the phone. My last question is when things feel safe, what's the number one first thing you're going to do when you get loose for fun? Man, I just want to see and hug people. <laughs> the one thing we're not supposed to do. Isn't that right? Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yes, well, sir. again, thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And, uh, uh, I'll stay in touch. If you have any questions, of course, I'm always here for you, man. Thanks for reaching out. Okay, take care. So uh, in, the, in the chat in the Q&A, did that sound fairly natural? And could you, could you see yourself calling anybody, whether you haven't talked to them for one year, three years, four years? When you ask how, you fe how are you feeling right now, it's a, um, it's a more honest question and it allows for, for a better answer. So I want to give one last piece before we, before we uh, open up for questions here. If you're familiar with Stephen Covey, he wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he said that all of us have our three areas of focus, and he has three concentric circles. And the first circle is our circle of concern. It's our outer circle. It's the things that we're aware of, we're concerned about, but in fact, um, uh, we, we can't do anything about. And then the second circle after that, the middle circle is what's known as your circle of influence. Things that you can influence, in other words, potentially people on your database. And then the center circle is your circle of control. In other words, things that I have direct control over. And what he says is that people who are drifters or victims in ninja speak spend most of their time focusing on their circle of concern. They watch the news, they watch YouTube, they watch social media, and they live in a generally reactive, freaked out environment, totally focusing on things that they have no ability to influence. Players or ninjas, we focus on our circle of influence and our circle of control. So let's talk about what you can control. We focus on those two circles. The first thing you can control is you can do the ninja nine. You can do the five daily habits and the four weekly habits. If you've kind of fallen off of a groove, take your Ninja 9 back out and start doing them because every single one of them can be done virtually and by Zoom. The last thing I wanna to bring to your attention that might be a beautiful piece to work on for the next two weeks uh, is this book, Atomic Habits. Maybe some of you have read it. I think it's an amazing book. It's the first book in my lifetime that I read all the way through and then I read a second time. And there, there have been four books about changing habits that have kind of been out there for the last you know, four years. Uh, the first one, of course, is The Slight Edge that we love and we still believe in. Then another book called The Power of Habit came along by Charles Duhigg about three, four years ago. Great book, but not quite as I think as powerful as this. And then another book showed up um, uh, called Tiny Habits, which I thought was great. 
But I want to share with you this book. First of all, it's on Audible. James Clear uh, reads it himself. This is just a lovely, lovely book. Uh, and I want to walk you through a couple of things he said that really changed how I'm going about some things right now. He says that the most important thing in creating a habit is that it has to align with your identity. In other words, if you have a, a vision of yourself that is different from the habits that you're trying to create, you will never create the habit. So what he suggests is before you create a habit, you have to create with clarity your identity. In other words, your vision of and for yourself. And then you create habits that match your identity. Because if you have habits that don't match your identity, they will never succeed. Let me give you an example of what he said. He said, we've been taught all of us to set goals. And by the way, this guy is this crazy athletic superstar. And he says, here's what we know about goals. Uh, when you set hard and fast goals, like I, you know, I eat a clean diet all the time, or I'm not, I'm going to exercise every day for seven days. He said, they're great when you succeed, but often when you miss a goal, it's almost more self-defeating than helping. And he said, so the best way to fall off the wagon is to set a goal and not hit it, which I thought was pretty brilliant. So he has an alternative way, and this is our assignment for this week. Before we start talking about creating habits, you've got a week or two maybe still left, maybe three weeks on lockdown or in, at stay at home. Finish the following sentence that says, I'm the type of person that, rather than I have a goal to, and let me give you some examples he gives in the book. He says, I'm the type of person that eats healthy food. I'm the type of person that keeps my commitments. I'm the type of person that takes care of my body, for example. I'm the type of person that cares about the people around me. I'm the type of person that is aware of other people's needs. Now, these are examples. And so the most important thing is for you to start and make a list of what type of person would you like to be and what type of person that you are that you want to keep and define your identity or your vision for yourself that you go, I'm the type of person that eats healthy food. Let's just say you assume that and now you're at the grocery store and you see five bags of Cheetos and you go, well, if I buy five bags of Cheetos, does the type of person that eats healthy food buy Cheetos? And if you start to reflect against the type of person that you are want to be, you go, no, the, the type of person that I want to buy maybe buys some vegetables that I could snack on. So the first thing is to clarify your identity. Now, hold that thought. For 42 years, I got licensed in 1978. I've been trying to figure out the real best metaphor between the, the real estate organization, the company, and the agent. And I want to share this with you and see if this resonates. Ultimately, I believe that the company you choose to be with is like an NFL football team or a basketball team, but it's a, it's a major league uh, team that you're affiliated with. In your case, uh, everybody on the call that I'm pretty much aware of, you happen to belong to the Super Bowl winning team in your area. You're, you are on the big dogs. But the team is in charge of creating the plays. It's in charge of changing the uniforms. It's in charge of leading where you're headed. It's in charge of providing the coaching, etc. Your job is you're the quarterback. In other words, another way to put it is you're the CEO on the field. Your job is to throw the ball metaphorically. In other words, you've got to find the buyers and the sellers. You have to connect with them. You have to manage the club. Closings, you call the audibles when things are happening that you didn't expect, and you create a culture of your team on the field. So hold that thought. In addition to clarifying your individual identity, you want to clarify your business identity. So from now forward, instead of saying, I'm a realtor, I'm a sales associate, say, I am the CEO of my real estate business. I'm the quarterback on the field. Um, I am, you know, which, whoever your favorite quarterback is, uh, it's my job to make the plays. I, I play for the world-class organization, but I still have to win the games. So as the CEO of my business, you want to identify what your identity is. So here's some choices. As the CEO of my business, I'm in charge of defining the culture in my business. I follow a system. Great, great quarterbacks, great CEOs, and great companies follow systems, of course. We believe the Ninja Nine is the great system. I enjoy taking care of my people because as the CEO, I need the people around me 
to be happy do doing what they're doing. I take pride in adding value to the people I know. So the next thing you have to do is identify what your identity as the CEO of your business is and how you see yourself. So that's the second piece. Now check this out. If you're in charge of creating the culture in your business, and we haven't defined yet what your business really is, uh, one of my favorite authors, Patrick Lencioni, he asks how important a culture is culture. His answer is culture is how we get things done. And it is the guiding light in your organization. So if you're in charge of creating the culture in your company, we have to decide what your company is. And the company, your company is your tribe. It's the 200 people on your database. And as James Clear, James Clear says, nothing sustains motivation than being in the right tribe, belonging to the right tribe. You're belonging to Colda Banker, you're belonging to Colda Banker Real Estate Group or Colda Banker West or Colda Banker Legacy, all the Colda Bankers. You have made a decision and I would support that you are absolutely as part of the right tribe. That's what sustains you, but now here's where the esteem is gonna come for your people. Your mindset shift going forward is the people on your database are your company. In other words, your people, the, your customers, your colleagues, your friends, the people in your database are your tribe. And so the question is, are you creating a culture amongst the 200 people on your database? Or are you looking at them as marks or just prospects rather than people that you create a culture for? And we saw this phrase, and I thought this is just so obvious, but it must be stated. How you treat people is how they treat you. In other words, how are you treating the people on your database? And then they'll treat you accordingly. So this week, last assignment, and then we're going to open it up for questions. As the CEO of your people, your database, here's your first assignment. If you were to hire three people right now, before this thing comes back, and you decided, you know, I'm gonna crush it because I hear this thing about the wave coming and I'm gonna start paddling and I'm gonna be ready because whether it happens in July or August, we don't know. But let's assume you decided to hire a transaction coordinator and a buyer's agent and a, and, a, and a listing coordinator, who knows. Before you hired them, any good CEO would write down the three behaviors that they would want anyone that worked for, for that company to practice. In other words, do you want them to be stingy? Do you want them to be generous? Do you want them to be kind? Do you want them to reach out? Do you want them to be proactive or reactive? And so my hope would be that three of the behaviors you would write down would be, I want my people to be warm and friendly. I want them to reach out to our customers proactively. In other words, anticipate their needs. And I want, would want them to be responsive. Anybody that works for me, those are the three most important behaviors. Write them down, don't just bring it into your mind, then apply them to yourself. And you say, am I truly being proactive? Am I reaching out? Am I always kind and responsive? And then here's the million dollar question that I want to ask yourself this week. Would the people, would my people on my database know right this minute that I cared about them based on how I've treated them in the last 30 days? And the only answer that I think is acceptable is they should, and I have not behaved in a manner, or I have behaved in a manner that would let everybody on my database know that I cared about them. So let's finish this up. If the law of authenticity says that the greatest gift you have to offer is yourself, your best ninja skill right now is to be a good listener. Let's not focus on what to say. Let's focus on what to hear. Ask more than you talk give them the opportunity to feel heard, be a proactive connector, not a proactive prospector or a proactive call maker. We're trying to create connections with people. We're not trying to create business. We're trying to create rapport and relationship. And here's the key, use the phone. Texting is hiding, email is hiding. Everything happens in the conversation. And right now, 80% are picking up the phone. Take advantage of that unique opportunity and uh, so the big message is to love on your people. The last thing before we go, you know, we've been doing these free webinars and I don't know if you missed any of them over the last month. We did five of them. Most of you or many of you are on our, on our emailing list, but if you missed any of them, um, 
there are five really pretty great webinars that might support everything we're saying here. Uh, we now finally have a Ninja U app. We don't call it U like university, but it's Ninja U. It's free. Go to the App Store, Google Play. You get it. Here's what it looks like. And uh, then all of the free content immediately is available to you. And it plays while you're working out. It doesn't stop like YouTube. Uh, Ninja U has been a year and a half long project where not only do we have the free stuff there, but we have this membership piece where you probably know that that most of your managers have been doing a, a weekly or monthly lunch and learn with the webinars. Um, so all the free content is there. The webinars are now hosted there. They used to cost 20 bucks a month. Um, they're all now in here, most of them. We also have interviews with top ninjas in North America. Uh, soon there will be uh, interviews from your, your peeps. Um, we also have these interesting conversations where Larry Kendall, who wrote the book, explains where all these processes came from. Uh, the origination of the buyer's process. Uh, we have a cool ninja skills library if you want to practice, get better. Uh, then Larry goes through the entire book, which just got released on Audible. We're very excited about it. And finally, for the same cost as the webinars, uh, now you get the whole thing for $19.99. Build monthly if you want to check it out, please do. But the app is free and you get access to all the free stuff there. So I want to close with one of Charles Darwin's most favorite quotes, the, the supposed uh, theorist who invented evolution and uh, survival of the fittest. And he says, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent. It's the ones that are most adaptable to change. And I just want to give Peter and Mike a fantastic shout out, hold a banker for adapting quickly to change. Uh, thank you for your time today. What I'd like to do now is stop sharing and uh, let's open up Q&A, the chat, and let's see what we got here. So Peter, uh, awesome job, awesome job. I, um, I have to say you lost some of us with your analogy of the quarterback and you're the CEO when you show a Bears photo there. So I would just recommend changing that photo out to a team that actually knows how to um, hire a quarterback and get a quarterback that has a tendency to know how to win. Well, you, uh, that probably just the only flaw in your whole entire thing was using well, the Bears quarterback as your analogy of you're the CEO and the one. Well, in now Laura's saying go back, go. So here's the funny thing. I actually worried about that. When I was picking it, I go, it would be inappropriate to pick like, you know, uh, Patrick Mahomes. Maybe it wasn't. So I was, I, this, this just, this took a lot of energy to pick that picture. So um, well, I appreciate as it. A bear, as a Bear fan, we're actually looking forward to this season. It might be one of the best seasons we have. Because <laughs> so, you won't play? Because we won't play. <laughs> So, um, but no, great job. I, I will say that um, there, there are questions that are coming in here and comments that are coming in here and everyone loves you as usual. Um, but coming off of yesterday's Zoom yes. and talking about be a good listener, yesterday's was on empathetic listening and, and empathy-based listening. And, and it, it kind of ties perfectly into your message um, about going out and, and you know, I, I look back at your message, the way that you, you tied in the, the waves and catching the wave, but the certainty is that there is a market, right? So now we've identified that there's a wave. Now we need to be paddling as hard as we can towards that. And we need to be ready to be up and running once we get back to it. For those that are digging their head in the sand right now, it's not just going to fall into your lap. You have to be paddling hard right now. So yeah. I mean, I love that, you know, even though we're Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana, we get we get it. You know, I've never surfed, but I get it. You yep. know, we have to be ready. We have to be paddling hard right now. So I so appreciate the way that you you can, can we. There's a couple of great questions here, and you know, Mike, one of the things you just said that that I want to put a footnote to. In Ninja, one of the things we put up is um, there. Everybody knows twelve realtors, and what's happening right now is ten of those twelve realtors are head in the sand. They're not doing anything. And in two months, when people are ready to do something, the person they're gonna remember is the person not who sent a blanket email, not who sent a text, but the person who just called up and said, how are you feeling right now? Yeah, uh, and, and I can't drill that feeling thing um, uh, right now. And I've got, boy, there's a bunch of great questions. Can I just jump into a couple of these right now? Uh, You're good enough to read them and answer them. That's great. Usually Peter is the one that has to multitask. So. I, one of the things we learned in Colorado is how to read, so this is good. 
So when reconnecting with your database, what are suggested messages to leave when people don't answer their phone? Absolutely leave a message. And I think it's identical. And it would sound just like if Peter were on mute, I'd go, hey, Peter, this is Peter Parnag at uh, Cold to Maker West. You know, I've been thinking about you during this time. Haven't talked to you for a couple of years, but you've been crossing my mind. Felt like the right time to pick up the phone. How are you feeling doing all these things? You know, what are you most nervous about? If you want to call back, I'd love to hear from you. But if not, no worries. Just know you've been crossing my mind. And that's what I think the message would sound like. It's almost identical. Um, <laughs> Carolyn, hi. Uh, how should we respond to millennials hoping for the market to crash so they can afford a house? Uh, most importantly, give them some data. Uh, I think the most important thing is to say, you know, if you track the appreciation in your marketplace, and you can do it, Carolyn's in, uh, Carlin is in Albuquerque, um, data is the most valuable thing we can offer. And I think when you show them, you know, the market only crashed in 2008 because of some goofy stuff. So trying to time a market is... It's a fool's game, essentially. Uh, appreciation has been fantastic. We consider it to go back in. So let's see if we can find you a house that fits your needs. But I'd ask them a question. Do you only want to buy a house if you can steal it? Or do you want to buy a house to live in? You know, I would, I would piggyback on that. You know, the, the hardest part about marketing, I think, is knowing your audience. And I think today, we know our audience because it's going to be one-on-one -on -one phone calls. So you can address those, you know, if you have a millennial, the market is strong. So don't wait for that. I mean, if, if it's not, if you're not a millennial and you're debating, this is the time that I want to sell or I want to buy. So you have to, it's easier today, I think, to shift if you're doing the things you need to be doing. And that is picking up the phone, making the phone call. That's awesome. I think you couldn't have said it better. Yeah. Ninja's rule. I just saw that. Any other questions before, uh, before we sign off? I'm going to look at the Q&A differently. Is there anything different in here? So Peter, when we role played, um, how soon would you follow up on that conversation? About 30, 45 days. You know, once you've made the connection, you've shared a little bit about the marketplace, unless something, um, uh, this is a good phrase, I just got to say this, time in the market is better than timing the market. That's really good. Um, all we want to make sure in the next 20 or 30 days is that you have a live, at least an attempted call with everybody in your database. Then what happens in the call will dictate when you, when you call back, somebody might go, whoa, I had no idea, you know, what do you think my house is worth? Well, obviously you respond to that. Uh, take good notes when you make the call and then you'll know what to do. Is that the right answer? You're, you're, you're the ninja. Yeah, I, I, I think you just, you play everyone by ear. That's the whole point. There is no, they're hard and fast. You know what, at Ninja, our goal is to make sure you have a live interaction with everybody on your database at least two if not three times a year. Many of us have not done that in the last six to nine months and now is such a beautiful time. And let me restate this. Make sure that you include the people you know that aren't in San Diego or aren't in Chula Vista or aren't in, in your town. Reach as wide as you can because it's a globe and you're missing huge opportunities. And you know what will happen. I'll call Peter. Peter and I will remember that time that we were on vacation together in Seattle and he'll go, we just talked to our friend in Maine who's thinking about moving to Chicago and we'll go, this is so weird. So don't limit yourself would be my other message. Call everybody. Caring and caring about them. That's, that's yep. crucial today. Not that you should always. Are you feeling, are um, you feeling right now? Yep. Someone asked here, uh, can you give us the name of the app again? Yeah, it's Ninja U, Ninja Y-O-U, not universally like. Wait a second, it's all about you. What did Barb just said? When we talk to people out of town, what can we say to, uh, here's the key, and Barb, this is a really great question. One of the things at Ninja, we don't try and talk about real estate. We just talk about connection. If real estate comes up, then you can respond, but I don't think you have to introduce any ideas about great realtors from the United state. If they say, hey, we're thinking about selling our house, you say, hey, do you have a go-to realtor? If not, maybe I could help you with that. But I don't ever wanna be the person bringing up real estate in the call. Sort of counter to everything I was trained for 30 years, you know, the <laughs> if you've been around one of the trainers that at the end goes, oh, by the way, Mike, if you know anybody that's thinking of buying or selling, keep me in mind, which just took a great call and turned it into a pitch. Um, so we don't do that around here, at least at Ninja. Anything else? 
Well, Peter, I know you did a great job presenting. I think you you hit on everything everybody was was looking for to hear. And again, rounding out our these Zoom series that we've been going through. Um, if, if there's not more questions, um, I, I see them coming in there. We've only got probably another five or six minutes here. Um, we can sign off, but I see some questions popping in there. Are you? Somebody uh, somebody said they just found Am um, Atomic Habits for eleven ninety five on Amazon. I cannot recommend that book enough. Uh, it is. And right now, if you're reaching out and, and during the amended social contract, thank you, Michelle, I would really take this time to, to re-examine what is your identity going forward? Am I going to be an on-accident realtor just trying to get deals? Or am I going to really start to think of myself as the CEO of my business? And am I acting as that every day? And if somebody judged me from my database, would they go, are they, in sh are they demonstrating that they care or are they just praying that I remember them and give them a referral? And I think that mindset shift could be very powerful going forward, given the time we have left to reflect and really design our new, our new us. All right, ma'am. Thank uh, you. Looks like we got it. David Taxer, Atomic Habits is a fantastic book. I agree. Peter, thank you. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for saying Peter, you're a rock star. Makes me feel feel really good. You Even are. though I know it's not for me, it's for you. It's Peter. totally for you. <laughs> <laughs> you are a rock star, Peter. Thank you so much for, for uh, jumping on this call with us. Hey, take care, guys. Have a great day, and uh, let's go crush it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Take care. Have a good day.